this is downtown Muskegon. A lot of people got apartments over the stores or in stores that had been closed up. I'll bet there were some in the Walt Plant store, for example, because it was boarded up. You have here, this is East Ottawa. A lot of Hispanics lived in these apartments there. Kind of a rundown area even then. But here we have one of the nice apartments, the Hamilton Arms. Still there, and it's still a pretty nice apartment, even though it's about 67 years old. Here we have, I can't see, all right, I'll look here. Now here's Rodman Terrace. Now notice two things. First of all, the streets are all named military terms. Defense Avenue. Uh, you got uh, uh, Convoy. Um, Bellum, Latin for war. And notice too, it's in Muskegon Heights, or Muskegon Township. It's not in the city limits. City of Muskegon didn't want these government projects undermining the integrity of the city. So they did not allow them in the city limits except for Green Acres, and they fought that one tooth and nail. So there's the first one. And this is what it looked like. It's a huge place. Many, many different apartments here. Hundreds. Here's another view of the same place. Now this is Forest Homes over on the right. Again, the, all that we have left of that is the uh, Norway, Sunday Norway Hall, which you see in the background here. This is what the buildings look like on a rainy day. I don't know if that's a sinkhole, George, or not, but I don't want to go there. Uh, here's another view of, of Forest Homes. Uh, now here's Ryerson Heights. This was where the whites, oh, I should go back to that one. This is where they housed the families of, of war uh, veterans, of people who were in the war, either Navy or Army. So if you were in the Army or Navy, your family could live here while you were in the military. Uh, here we have Ryerson Heights. Again, this is for um, um, uh, whites and, and uh, Hispanics, who are again considered whites at that time. You know, here's a, at the top you see, uh, that's Marquette. On the left is Getty and there's a creek, Ryerson Creek, at the bottom. Now there's only one road in there, it's called Churchill Boulevard. And again, notice the connection with, with the Prime Minister of Britain. And here's, the, out at the bottom you see the configuration of the 45 buildings. The Hispanics were all at the far right, and the rest of the people were at the, uh, occupying the other buildings. Now this is these Hispanics, and I've interviewed quite a few, uh, these are pretty tight dwellings. The rooms are small. But this is where often they came from. They came from a migrant labor background, and everybody in the family was in one room. And of course, the main element of the room was this bed into which everyone crept at night. So a nice place like Ryerson Heights, even in the winter, was a whole lot better than they had known, some of them. Now, the, another picture of Ryerson Heights in the background. Now this gives you some idea of how they lived. Now this is one unit, you could have found this either at Ryerson Heights or in the Heights at uh, Fairview. Everybody got a living room, two bedrooms, and a kitchen. Once in a while you would find a three bedroom apartment, but mostly they were two bedroom, and you're side by side with a lot of neighbors. Again, this is Fairview, these are the places in the Heights. I have never seen a picture of Fairview, uh, but I'll give you what it probably looked like. Most of the buildings there were either um, trailers or double wides, like these in the foreground. This is from Willow Run, uh, but it's the same concept, I think. Here again, they did have some um, concrete and, and the wood buildings. Those were built in the Heights, too, and uh, some of them were still around into the 50s and maybe even later. And then here's Green Acres. I don't have a good picture of it, but it's right where Yuba Street would be today, right near Eastern, on the edge of Muskegon. And this is where all the trailers were and they were hot bunking. And they look like this. This is not from Green Acres, but it's pretty much what it looked like. They had one administrative building where you could get a shower, otherwise it was a, and a hot meal and otherwise it was hot bunking in one of these for eight hours at a time. Home front, let me move on here. A lot of people did things in the, uh, while they were waiting for the war to end. 
The popular thing was going to the theater, Michigan Theater downtown. Here's the Regent, which was down the block and across the street. Popular things to do. Now, if you had a girlfriend, boyfriend, husband, wife, significant other, uh, you went to the Pomona um, uh, House, the Pomona Pavilion on, uh, in, in Fruitport on Spring Lake. Big bands played there all the time. Frank Lockie owned it. He had his own band. Lots of fun times. Apparently, I don't remember this, but uh, Steve tells me they danced in that section that crosses the road there. And then they dined in the two parts on each side. Uh, here's the arcade. You could go down there. That's a bus terminal. But you could also shop at the Rexall store or uh, play in the arcade. Uh, of course, you could go down to the beach. Buses would take you down to the Lake Michigan Beach. You could go down there. Uh, or you could go shopping. This one, I think, is uh, Hardy. Uh, yeah, W.D. Hardy, one of the big department stores in town. Uh, here we have some women uh, shopping in there. You don't get personal treatment like that much at uh, Walmart, that's for sure. Uh, this is Grossman's when it was still in business, big locally owned department store. Poor people who couldn't afford to go to Grossman's would go to federal department store. That's sort of the Walmart of Muskegon at that time. Um, not a lot of people did go there. Prices were cheaper. Or you get your hair done. Uh, these are African Americans going to a bunch of hairdressers who are also African American. Now this was the big phrase during the war. Use it up, wear it out, make it do, do without. And they'd been doing that since the Depression. So this was not hard. They just had to continue doing what they used to do. Except now they had lots of money, except they couldn't spend it. Nothing to spend it on much. So for example, uh, if you had been fortunate enough to buy a car in 1941, <laughs> you kept it. You kept it going with anything you could make it go. Uh, now these are some of the popular brands then, some of them no longer around. Cadillac, for example, Nash is gone, Willys is gone, Jeep's still around, uh, Packard is gone, and so forth. Here's some others, Mercury, Buick, Chrysler, so forth, and here's another one. All American-made products, uh, but uh, that was the last full year of production. They did make a few 42s, but they quit producing in February of 42, and no more until after the war. You could get a car, there were a few hundred made every year for government officials, but that was it. Ordinary people couldn't get them. Now this man is, he's a, bought his Pontiac here in 1941. He was a government employee, a, a farm agent, and he is noteworthy in front of the AAA office in Muskegon, Mr. Chamberlain. He had five new tires in, in 41, still had five tires in 44. 70,000 miles later, by rotating those tires as AAA told you to do, and he made them last. Not many people could do that. Or you go down to the beach or to the channel and fish. Meat was scarce. You had to get ration books for lots of kinds of meats. But you could catch all you wanted to down at the channel. And some people had better luck than others. I never caught that many fish, but I didn't live then. Transportation, again, here's the arcade, bus terminal. Uh, buses were the main means of transportation. A lot of people walked to work. And a lot of people uh, took a ride with somebody else. A friend of theirs had a car or they may be rotated. Again, we notice downtown Muskegon, that's the State Theater, and a, a Chinese restaurant above it. Flatiron Building, some of you remember that, that's Market Street, and uh, Western Market goes off to the left, and another bus and some cars.